That was a great job, Veronica. Thank you. About a month ago, Dawn sent me a, a link to a talk that uh, uh, Dr. Alan Berger gave, along with Herb Kay on this paper, Emotional Sobriety. It knocked me out. I had to listen to it twice. I really love that talk. I'm looking forward to uh, Alan participating with us live. I did a little research on him. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I never heard of him before, though he's published many things for Hazleton and he seems to be uh, very active in the uh, field of recovery. So help me welcome Dr. Alan Berger. Thank you so much, Joel. And, uh, you, you know, all of that stuff that, that I've accomplished in my career, I really owe to my recovery and to this program, this incredible program that we all share here. Joel, can you remind me, do I have about 30 minutes to share? Or what's my time frame here? You can talk as long as you want. It's an hour and a oh, half yeah. meeting. You can stop whenever you want. You can reference outside literature. This is not an AA. Right. No, I got that part of it. Okay. Well, what what I, I I will do is I'll share some of my own. I you know instead of making this professional, I'll make it more personal. I'll share with you my recovery, what emotional sobriety means to me, and as well as share with you the um, the impact it's had on my own life. Right. Because I, I think that that's important. You know, I do wear two hats. Like you said, Joel, I got a, a Dr. Berger hat and I've got an I'm Alan and I'm a, I'm a recovering alcoholic and addict. So I wear both of those and I'll keep on the first hat. But of course, I'll all be putting on the other hat from time to time. Um, I'll just start to share my journey started in this program um, over 51 years ago. Um, one day at a time this summer, I'll be celebrating 52 years in recovery. I am very fortunate that I, um, when I returned from Vietnam, I went into Marine Corps when I was 17. It was a geographic solution for my alcohol problem. I thought if I became one of the few and the proud, the Marines, it would solve my drinking. I'd be able to drink like a real man. Well, guess what? That didn't work. Another one of those ideas that wasn't going to work. I needed to, to look at some other issues that, thank God, I've been able to look at in the program. Went into the Marine Corps, full-blown teenage alcoholic, went to Vietnam in 1970 and started experimenting with other drugs. And I had the same experience that I had with alcohol. And I want to talk about my first experience with drinking because I think it's very rele relevant to what what makes emotional sobriety so important? Um, my first drink was at uh, 12 years old. And it was shortly after my father passed away from cancer. My dad died from multiple myeloma when he was 39. I was 11 years old. You know, up to the point my dad had cancer, I, I had, was enjoying life. I, had, I was blessed to have a father that loved being a dad. He was wonderful. I grew up in Chicago. We'd go to the Museum of Science and Industry, or we'd go to the Natural History Museum, and he'd stand at those grand doors, and we'd look at the T-Rex and the Triceratops facing off. And then he'd, some days he'd tell me a story about the, the Triceratops was able to, you know, to, to pierce the hide of, of the T-Rex, and he went off without his lunch. The other days, he got a Triceratops burger. And that's the kind of man he was. He loved his life. He loved living. He loved, you know, being a dad. He loved being a, a husband. And, and he was just, he was a joy. I mean, just a joy. I remember at about nine years old, he built me a go-kart from scratch, right? I'm the only kid on the block with a little go-kart driving around. And I mean, and in the winter time, he'd put snow tires on his motorcycle and pull us around the block on those little saucers. I mean, that's the kind of life I lived. When he got diagnosed and started to die from cancer, the family went upside down. He died the day after Christmas in 1963. And I'll never forget the moment that my mom walked into the living room and said, it was the day after Christmas, she says, your father passed away last night. At that moment, that trauma, just, I froze. I, I obviously I was crushed. I was devastated. 
I did not know how to process the reality that was happening in my life. And um, underneath that, I didn't realize it at the time, but there was this expectation that I had that I couldn't let go of that life wasn't supposed to be like this. This shouldn't have happened to me. Now, I was not the only one that experienced that experienced that you know the programming that i got growing up and i can you know i can give you some insight into it that my dad was my grandfather's his dad's only child so every time i would see my grandfather after my dad passed away my grandfather would say you are not supposed to bury your son your son is supposed to bury you when i was with my mom she says i was supposed to grow old with your father i wasn't supposed to raise you four children alone i don't know what i'm going to do i'm overwhelmed you see i didn't realize it but obviously in my world and i think in our world we get programmed don miguel ruiz calls it we get domesticated i like that term we get domesticated with all of these ideas on how life is supposed to be. And at 11 years old, I wasn't conscious of any of that, right? Those were unconscious at the time. But they were as much a part of my life as it was my grandfather who could give, find the words to express those. So when my dad died, I was devastated. I believe that I said to myself, I'm never going to let anyone become that important to me again. I'm never going to make myself this vulnerable. I'm never going to, you know, let someone else mean that much to me in my life again. And I withdrew from life. I was still in life. I was still participating, but it was like I was almost an observer of my life. I wasn't, I wasn't present. There were a lot of feelings going on, not only losing my dad, but, you know, here I'm 11 years old. I'm, a, you know, I'm attracted to girls. Am I handsome enough? Are they going to like me? So all of the what I would call normal adolescent angst, right, that we all went through was right front and center in my life as well at that point. Now, no one in it. it blows my mind, and it probably has a lot to do why I became a psychologist, not one person came up to me after my dad died and said, hey, son, how are you doing with that? What's it like for you losing that, your dad? Why don't we sit and talk about it for a while? What does this mean to you? Not one person until I was 19 years old, no one ever asked me that question. That happened in recovery, but it never happened in my life. Not a teacher, not an adult, not my mom, not my grandfather. Everybody was so lost in their own pain and grief or felt so uncomfortable about opening up that issue. They didn't know how to deal with my pain. I didn't know how to deal with my pain. So um, here I am at 12 years old. All of these feelings are going on inside of me. I have no idea how to deal with any any of them. I'm hanging out about two blocks from my house is Bobine Elementary School. That's where I went to school in Chicago. Behind the school were the kids that wanted to be cool, that wanted to get to the front of the school, where there was Robert Square Park, and there was some benches in the front of the park. And if you were a cool guy, you got to sit on the benches. The wannabe cool kids hung out in the back of the school. So one day, one of the cool guys from the front of the school comes back and he's got a six pack of beer with him. And he comes back and says, who, want, who would like a beer? Now, I thought that I was reaching out to that beer to become cool. But the minute I drank that beer, something else happened to me that was much more powerful than being cool. The minute I took that drink, I felt okay. I was free. I had emotional freedom. Regardless of all the stuff going on in my life, I was okay in that moment. I got to tell you, that experience was so powerful, I started sprinting headlong into alcoholism. Because if one made me feel like that, 
what was 10 beers going to make me feel like? Right? I wanted that. I That's what I wanted more than anything in my life, to have that freedom. Because I didn't know how to deal with what was going on. I didn't know how to deal with what was happening in my life. I didn't know how to deal with any of my feelings. And, you know, everybody was doing the best they could around me, but nobody else was dealing with their stuff either. So that was the first experience I had. That continued on. When I got exposed to drugs, you know, in the Marine Corps, I had the same thing, more freedom. You know, now you drop acid, you, you know, not only are you free from this, but man, you travel the universe and shit like that, right? So I was all over the place with this freedom, but did not have any idea that I could create that experience without using alcohol and other drugs. I had no concept that that was a possibility. This was my world. This was my existence. And that's what I did to try to continue to find a reason to live. Because if I didn't have that, I don't know what would have happened. So that just gives you a little bit of background, right? And I, I'm a teenage alcoholic. I'm out of control, blackout drunk. You know, I drop out of high school at 16 years old because it's getting in the way of partying all the time and, and finding my freedom. And I see how my life isn't going anywhere. I decide to join the Marine Corps into thinking that that would change my life. And it did, but not in the way that I had planned, <laughs> right? Came back from Vietnam and through a very, a lot of serendipitous experiences, I ended up being the third Marine admitted to the Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station's drug exemption program. When I was put in the program, it was three days old. I was the third Marine admitted into the program, and the program was just brought into existence because the Commandant of the Marine Corps realized we had all, all these guys coming back from Vietnam that had serious problems with drugs, and, and including alcohol, and all they were doing is discharging them and sending them back to the community and dumping the problem on the community. And so they said, you know what? We have an obligation to these guys. Let's try to help them. So I go into this program that's three days old. Now, like I said, it was serendipity. I, when I got to Hawaii, I turned myself into the first sergeant. I said, top, I got a drug problem thinking he's going to get me discharged so I can get back to Chicago, put Hendrix on and drop some more acid. And he looks up to me and says, Berger, you are one lucky Marine. And I'm going, what is, what is the first sergeant smoking, right? He goes, you're going into rehab. I'm going, what? He says, yeah. We just started this program. The Marine Corps, did, the Commandant, just see, I found the paper. The Commandant just signed this program into existence. So I was the third Marine. They had no idea what they were doing. They knew it, but they turned to the AA community because in 1971, there was no Narcotics Anonymous on the islands of Hawaii. NA at that point pretty much was bi-coastal, California and New York, all right? No meetings. So there happened to be this cadre of young people that had found this way of life, this 12-step way of life, with this AA guru, guru woman called Flobird, a 50-year-old hippie that was like the Pied Piper young people. And she had about 20 people living with her in the North Shore that were all committed to the recovery. And so Jerry, who was the staff sergeant in charge of the program, was also in the program. He says, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll start a Tuesday night recovery rap session, invite some young people in to just share what their recovery is like with you guys. Instead of talking about what's wrong with drugs and stuff like that and why you shouldn't use them, let's talk about what's right about recovery. I thought that was an ingenious, right, you know, approach to this whole thing. So that Tuesday night, they bring in this guy named Tom McCall. Tom doesn't mind me breaking his anonymity. Um, and you'll see, you know, uh, hopefully you'll understand why in a minute. So here's this hippie. There's about 20 of us combat veterans. We're all in our combat fatigues, you know, hair like mine um, right now, you know, uh, combat boots on. And this guy walks in and he's got a ponytail. He's got these John Lennon wire rim glasses. He's got his Birkenstocks on, standard issue for hippies in Hawaii. You know, his khaki pants, his khaki shorts, his Hawaiian print shirt. 
And, you know, we're looking at him like, you're sending this guy to talk to us? I mean, you know, first thought was we should kick his ass. I mean, he was probably out there protesting while we were out there fighting this war. Five minutes into Tom Scher, he had the room mesmerized. Now, my experience was that I had never experienced another person being this real and authentic in my whole life. He was talking about things that I felt that I would never tell you about because I was ashamed of them. Once again, you're going to hear the shoulds. I shouldn't feel that way. A Marine should never be afraid or insecure. You know, we're tough, man. We're tough guys. He was talking about feeling lost in his life. He didn't ever feel like he had a purpose and that he found himself becoming something that he didn't like with his use of alcohol and other drugs, that he couldn't even recognize himself, that he had a set of values that he had totally pushed to one side as a result of his drinking and using. And I'm relating to this guy every step of the way. What I saw was a man that had emotional sobriety. He had that emotional freedom that I felt when I picked up that drink when I was 12. And there was a part of me at that moment that said, you know what? If I can achieve that in my life, I might be able to make this life work. I might be able to find a way to be okay without having to drink or use ever again. All of a sudden, it was like there's this flash of hope like I never had before. Possibilities now were presented to me that I couldn't see. It was like Chuck C. talks about putting on a new pair of glasses. Oh, my God. I could see things clearer and at that moment brighter than I was ever able to see before in my life. I went up to him after the meeting and he says, Tom, how the hell did you get, get there? He says, stick close to me and I'll show you how. Tom is still my sponsor today after 51 years in the program. The journey we've been on together is remarkable. It's worth a book, right? It's worth writing a book about because it's been unbelievable how he's given me Everything that you just heard Bill describe in that letter, you know, the energy, the time, the, the commitment he's made to me and my life and to helping me find myself and, and be able to start to practice these principles in my daily affairs, I will be forever grateful for this man. And, you know, today the relationship is much more, you know, I, you know, he turns to me for, for guidance and support, and I turn to him for guidance and support. And it's, you know, one coward walking with the other coward's hand, so to speak, as Noel Coward talked about. Coward, take this coward's hand. So that's how my journey started. I got turned on to recovery big time. They didn't have any counselors. After I had 60 days clean, they say, hey, Berger, you want to become a counselor? <laughs> I go, Beats pushing a 105 millimeter howitzer around the base. So I, I, you know, came on board and I fell in love with helping people. Um, and then the second thing happened to me is that now I saw the value of making a difference in another person's life. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but I did care. And guys got well because it was one drunk talking to another drunk, one addict talking to another addict. And people got well with that. Still got some people that are in Hawaii that got sober as a result of the work that we did together back in 71. So the third thing happened after I'm a counselor, I said, my God, I'd like to sure become a psychologist. I think that this would be an incredible, this could be my purpose in my life. I mean, I could really, really, you know, this is a passion for me. You know, what is it that uh, Dr. David Viscott says, if you can find an avocation to be your vocation, you are a very lucky and gifted man. And I did that. I went back to school. I was a high school dropout. Remember that? No high school, literally. 
And I took my first college course at Chaminade College in Hawaii, and it was oceanography. And that's the third piece of passion that was lit. Fire was lit in my belly, was loving education. I fell in love with learning. I realized I wasn't as stupid as I thought I was. I could actually learn if I read the chapter and did the homework. My God, you, I can answer the questions. You know, it's like, that's such a basic thing. But I wasn't doing that anymore. I wasn't doing anything with school. And of course, I failed everything that I took. So that was my life. That's what's launched me in the recovery. And I mean, what an incredible launch into the program. And all along, it, you know, I kept bumping up against these things that Bill talked about. God, you know, I'm sober now. I'm working a good program. How come I'm still getting so upset about things? I remember at five years, I went to this one meeting in Long Beach at this Bank of America, and I was celebrating my fifth birthday. And I was so excited and stuff like that. And I was looking forward to celebrating and getting a cake at the birthday. And then, and then the guy says, well, we're going to celebrate birthdays. But, you know, nobody brought a cake tonight for the celebration. I took that personally. You did what? When things wouldn't go my way, all I could do is get pissed off about it. What I was starting to discover is what Bill talked about. He says every time that we're disturbed, whether it's a big deal or a little deal, there's something going on with us. There's some unhealthy dependence and it's consequent demand. Now, if you would have asked me back then, hey, did you want the possession and control of other people? I would say, oh no, only terrible people would want that. I would, I'm not one of them. I was so full of shit. Of course I wanted to possess and control you because my well-being depended on you doing what I wanted you to do. And if you didn't do it, and trust me, as I got more and more education in psychology, I became an expert manipulator. You know, I could talk about the reason you weren't giving me what I wanted is because obviously the kind of relationship you had with your, with your father. And if you, you weren't so screwed up with your father, you would, of course, be the person I want you to be. Because after all, I know what's right. God, can you see how full of shit I was? Still am. If I brought my wife in, she would say he's still a pissy baby and gets upset when things don't go his way. He says, you're right, honey. God isn't finished with me yet. I'm, I'm a work in progress. I, she says, well, you need to get a sign that says, hey, please be patient with me. I'm a work in progress. God isn't finished with me yet. Remind me because I forget sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff. So this journey has been unbelievable in terms of what's gone on. But I, I want to... I want to kind of talk about how, what it means to my life today with emotional sobriety, because you guys get a sense of it, right? Bill really got it. He saw that our basic flaw was this emotional dependency. And the emotional dependency, what, how I experience is I tend to take everything personally. Miguel Ruiz calls it that we're raised with this sense of personal importance, that it's all about me. Now, when I did my first fourth step, I could see the selfishness, but I could never see that it was tied to this personal importance in this emotional dependency. Because I was so dependent on you, I had to try to get everything my way to be okay. I couldn't have an unconditional relationship with you I had to do things to get you to do things. So there was always a hook in it. Always a hook. So being able to offer love and give love with an open hand that Bill talks about, I knew nothing of that. There was also always a condition that I tagged onto it. Now, I thought that was normal. Now, remember, I grew up when one of the big hits was John Lennon's song, You Can't Do That. If you guys listen to the words, you'll see that he wanted the possession and control of his girlfriend. You know, he says, I told you before, you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, he was controlling her. He didn't want her to talk to anybody. 
you know, all that stuff. He, she had to do what he wanted to do because that was the only way he was going to feel good. That's how I grew up with all of those conditions. So what you can understand that this emotional dependency meant that I was also depend dependent on how life was, that the demands were not just on people, but also on my experience with life. So when my father died, I had no way of being able to deal with that reality. I didn't like that reality. I remember one uh, experiment we did at Cal State Long Beach when I was working on my bachelor's degree in psychology. Dr. Barry uh, Stevens, he sent us around collecting graffiti off the different bathroom walls to see if there was a difference in the graffiti in, let's say, the math department and the biology department, psychology department stuff. It was a great, great natural experiment. Well, you know what I found in the, in the psychology department? This one guy wrote, um, um, reality is for people that can't handle drugs. I mean, he turned the whole thing around. I mean, reality is for people who can't handle drugs. I related to that. That's how I was living my life. I, that meant something to me back then. So here I'm going through life with all of these demands, most of which, and this is important for us to understand, were unconscious. I could not have articulated that I had those. The only thing that would give me some kind of indication of what was going on was my reaction when things didn't go my way. This is the importance of using Bill's protocol when he talks about that if we look at every disturbance we have, great or small, we will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependence and its consequent demand. That if you sit down and walk through and really do an, what I call an emotional sobriety inventory, and I have a sheet that you can use on my website that I think is a good way to do that, is you walk through these things, you start to see what those demands are, those claims that we made on life that have turned into expectations that then become unenforceable rules. And so I have all of these unenforceable rules, how life is supposed to be. And when life doesn't conform to these ideas, to my expectations, to my demands, to my claims, to my unenforceable rules, all I can do is object. And when I object, I would do one of two things. I would either get mad outside of me and blame the situation, what was wrong with this situation, it shouldn't be like that, or I'd fault myself. Neither of which helped me grow up. A brilliant psychologist, Dr. Virginia Satir, said, life is what it is. It's how we cope with it that counts. Life is what it is. I had no idea how to cope with it. I did not know the importance of acceptance, of being able to deal with the condition as it was, not as I wanted it to be. I didn't have those tools. My tools were always to try to manipulate and change circumstances and people to be what I wanted them to be. Bill talks about in the, tw in the 12 and 12, you know, when he's talking about step four, we have no idea what a true partnership really looks like because I want it all my way. And I was, he called it stupid and stubborn about it. And I could identify with that because I had no idea how wrong I was. None. This is why when he defines emotional sobriety as humility, right? He says, it's, he says balance and maturity, which is to say humility in relationship with ourselves, with our fellows, and with God. I also add in there relationship with life. You see, humility means things don't have to live up to my expectation for me to be okay. The emotional dependency creates a consciousness that says, I'm okay if. It's an I'm okay if consciousness. It's a consciousness that has a lot of rules 
expectations, demands about how things are supposed to be, how I'm supposed to be, how you're supposed to be, how life is supposed to be, how God is supposed to be. That's the kind of consciousness I had. Now, I used to think that that was pathological. I don't believe that anymore. I think that that consciousness is what we start life with. And that this it's all about me is part of the experience we have in life. But if, if we're met in the right way, it moves from an I'm okay if consciousness to a much more differentiated consciousness that says I'm okay even if. You see, emotional sobriety for me today is I'm okay even if things don't go my way. Now, I may not be okay the minute I'm disappointed. See, by the way, that's a big part of this, isn't it? I never wanted to be disappointed. That's one of the reasons I set up all these rules. I was trying to create an existence that was free from disappointment, free from pain, free from grief. I didn't want to be human. I wanted something else that had nothing to do with all those damn feelings that I didn't want. So the evolution is to go from this I'm okay if consciousness to I'm okay even if. And now my well-being has to do with how I deal with what I'm experiencing, not with what I'm experiencing. Let me say that again. My well-being has to deal with what how I'm dealing with what I'm experiencing, not what I'm experiencing. That's the key here. That's the key to unlock our emotional freedom. Because if I can start to develop this practice of emotional sobriety, and it is a practice, you're never going to get there completely. I've been working on this stuff. I'm a lot better today. I'm going to share you know, a, a, an anecdote with you in terms of something I went through. Um, 10 years ago now, that I think was very, very powerful experience that showed me the incredible power of the this idea that we're talking about tonight. But <clears throat> this is a key. And Bill said it, Bill said it in the 12 and 12. He says, if we practice these principles in our daily affairs that we and those about us find emotional sobriety. You see, the expressly stated purpose of this program is, is for you to discover emotional sobriety. To me, that's the best kept secret in the room. I've been to a lot of meetings. It's only within the last five years with meetings like you guys are doing that people are bringing this into the mainstream discussion of recovery. No one in the meetings I've ever been to and says, hey, you know why you're working the steps? So you can find emotional sobriety. Nobody ever said that. Not one person. Incredible. So that was in the 1950 when Bill was writing the 12 and 12. This letter he wrote six years later that became the grapevine article eight years after he was writing the 12 and 12, but it was in his consciousness that this program is about emotional freedom. Because if you discover emotional freedom, you never have to drink or use again the rest of your life. There's no need for it. The obsession to drink, the compulsion will be completely lifted. It's irrelevant. It's unnecessary. It's not a part of your life in any way anymore because you don't need it to be. Alcoholism is a solution. It was a solution. It was the best thing I could come up with at the time in my life to try to find myself and to try to find that freedom. And I think it's what every one of us is looking for. And we all are going to go ahead and discover it in whatever way we can. Thank God I've been given the gift of finding some pa a pathway that's a lot more healthy than drinking and using. And so I'll share a little bit about that. That's what we're going along here. So I'm um, still okay with time, right, Joel? I'm fine. All right. So 10 years ago, um, I've been married. This is my third marriage. I'm continuing to practice. I'm hoping practice is going to help me grow up a little bit because every one of these marriages I've been in has been incredible for me. I've, 
I've been divorced, but I still, I'm still very much connected to my other, my previous two wives. And, and I met a gal who was, uh, and not because of this, but she was much younger than me. And so part of the deal is if we got married that I'd be open to having kids. Well, I have two children with my second wife that are right now 37 and, and 35. And I love being a dad. You guys can probably figure that out. I had that experience with my dad. Nothing I wanted more in my life to be able to, to experience being a father with my children. So when she said to me, hey, you know, you know, I'll let you put a ring on this finger, but, you know, only if you want to have kids with me. And I said, I'm game. I love being a dad. So 10 years ago, we got pregnant. I'm 71. I was 50, um, 61 at that time. Kind of late in life to be pulling off that deal, but I'm crazy about the woman. I'm crazy about being a dad. So we, she was working on her post postdoc at UCLA. She's a PhD cancer biologist, and so she was doing her postdoc at UCLA. And I had a practice in uh, Southern California in Hermosa Beach, and so we decided we would use the midwife group at UCLA to bring our child into the world. Well, when you sign up for UCLA, you sign up for all of the wonderful services that they provide. And so the midwives, you know, they encouraged us to go do genetic testing. And part of the reason behind that is, is that if there is going to be a problem with a, a birth of a child, they want to be in front of it rather than behind it. They don't want to have to play catch up. They don't want parents to play catch up. They want parents to go in with what in psychology we call anticipatory coping, right? That you've got an idea of what you're going to need to do to deal with the situation. So we go in, we meet with a genetic counselor who goes through our history and stuff like that. And they take about probably 10 of those little bottles of blood from my wife's arm. And I asked, well, why aren't you guys taking blood from me? Well, the midwife says, I, I don't want to offend you with this, but you're not that important. <laughs> I go, I, I've learned that. I've been told that in the last, you know, several years in my recovery. I go, but what do you mean by that? She says, because if your wife doesn't have any genetic vulnerabilities, it doesn't matter what your genes are. Her genes are going to carry the, carry, carry the weight. I go, oh, great. So we're going to well baby visits. We don't hear any feedback. We think no feedback is good feedback until one day. I left to go down to work in Hermosa Beach. She's up at UCLA. I get a phone call from her and she can hardly speak. She's in tears. She says, you have to come back to UCLA. I go, what happened? She could hardly tell me about it, but she said, that when you left, I was walking over to the lab and I got a call from the midwife. She says, you have to come back. I have the results from the genetic testing and we need to talk. So she came back and they did identify a gene that if I also had this gene, the child would be born with a congenital deformity called muscular at uh, spinal atrophy. And what it means is the child's, the nervous system never hooks up to the lungs. So if it's worst case, the child will live about a year and a half. Never be off of a ventilator. Best case, they've never had a child live past 14 years old. Well, you can understand what that must have meant to first my wife when she heard that, and then to me. You know, I'm now anxious. I'm having panic attacks. We're crying uncontrollably. I have to give blood now because we need to find out what the reality is. Six weeks before the blood test is going to get back. It's that involved of a test. So we leave UCLA. Of course, I cancel my patients for the rest of the day, and we're moving in and out of sobbing and crying and panicking. And I reach out to my sponsor, to my friends. I get some wonderful support from everybody. She gets some great support from her family and friends, but it doesn't make a difference. You know, I'm projecting, I've already got the gene, of course, right? I mean, I've, I'm projecting into the future these catastrophic outcomes. I'm seeing us sitting at UCLA next to this child who's going to die in a year and a half. And I'm just, you know, devastated. 
and she's devastated. And we, I can't get, you know, we talk about an emotional sobriety, getting your balance back. I'm knocked off balance. How can I recover my balance in this situation? And we talk, we try to support each other. We go to bed that night, tried to sleep. You guys, I'm sure you tried to sleep when you were anxious. It, you don't get a restful sleep. You're tossing and turning all night long. You doze off, you wake up. But as often happens to me, is if I can get a little distance from a situation, it's almost like that space is where God can talk to me. And I woke up the next day and I said to myself, God, Alan, you talk about this emotional sobriety and you help other people get a handle on this. What's missing? And then it hit me. I was letting the situation dictate what I was going to do. I said to myself, if I'm so lucky to get a child and I can only have that child for a year and a half, I will love that child a lifetime in a year and a half. And if God wants us to have that child for 14 years, I'll love that child for 14 years. I'll give that child love a lifetime of love in 14 years. It doesn't matter the condition that I'm going to be met with. What matters is how I'm going to meet that situation. The minute I had that awareness, that epiphany, that insight, or that God-given grace, whatever you want to call it, my anxiety dissipated. It was like I ate a bar of Valium. I swear to God, I had no anxiety. I was centered, focused, and ready to, to deal with whatever I had to deal with. I shared it with my life, my wife, and she, just like Bill said, that, that we and those about us find emotional sobriety, she had the same benefit. She goes, oh my God, of course, that's what we're going to do. Because that's what we've decided to do. That's who we are going to be. At that moment, I understood the power of what Bill was talking about. I understood the power of emotional sobriety and the power of a consciousness that leads to this emotional freedom. Blew my mind. Then my good friend, Dr. Harry Heratunian, used to be the medical director out at the Betty Ford Center. He says, he said, you know, Alan, you didn't realize it. But you had an expectation that you should have a normal child. I go, you're right, Harry. There it is again. One of these unconscious demands and claims that life is supposed to be the way I want it to be because that's what will be good for me. Well, guess what? It's not about me. Humility is a low focus on self. And it's understanding our limitations. This life is not going to be what I want it to be. It's going to be whatever it's going to be. It's my job to be able to figure out how to cope with whatever life sets in front of me. So that's my share with you guys tonight. It's been a remarkable journey. I keep going. I, I have a workshop after this one. Uh, that, in fact, it starts at 10 o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time. I'll send... Uh, Jay, the links and stuff, he can pass them out to you guys and stuff. If you ever want to do a double, if you want to double dip one night and jump from this one into that one, you're all welcome to it. It's a great workshop. We're now going through the 12 steps and we're talking about the 12 steps and how they help us develop what we are calling an authentic um, self-esteem that's based on humility, which is a real important component, right, of emotional sobriety. The first half hour of these meetings, I, sh I share, I give a, a brief talk on something. I have three other colleagues that join me. Herb Kagan is one of them. Roger Andes, another therapist I've worked with for a long time, Tom Rutledge. Those are all recorded. So there's about 60 videos out there that you can watch from this meeting too. I'll send that link to Jay too, and he'll be able to disseminate it to you guys and and post it. I I might be able to do it now while, while, we're, uh, while you guys share. But um, thank you so much for having me tonight, and I, I hope I've 
shed a little light on this incredibly important part of our recovery experience. Dr. Berger, you were excellent. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Part of your talk started spurred a question inside of me and I'm gonna break the rules because usually we go to you and you get to pick somebody you want to speak to. But I do have a question. Go right ahead, Joel. My expectation yeah. was that I should have had a loving mother. Yeah. I shouldn't have been abused as a child. Yep. I was abused to the point where I've been in psychotherapy and was diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. All the praying I've done, all, and, and everybody tells me, you got to learn to forgive. You got to learn to forgive. And I cannot forgive her. Well, listen, so, you know, it's like, what do you do with it? How do you find your emotional freedom when you are that wounded and that hurt? And you're right. See, as, as children, and this is why I said before, our emotional dependency doesn't say something's wrong with us. It's just when you're an adult, you have it. It's not very functional anymore. That's the problem. But as a kid, we're in completely dependent on the, our parents emotionally. And, you know, some parents are better able to do it than others. Now, unfortunately, you know, if, if it's true that you were a spirit out there, you picked her, we can look at what the hell were you doing, Joel, picking her as your mom. But I don't know if I believe any of that. The issue becomes now is what do you do with that pain and suffering so you can get free from it? See, that becomes the issue. So one thing is, is, I know for me, when I've worked with people, I have to take off the expectation that they should forgive them. And I have them go into the rage about how dare you. Then what starts to happen is they do that. How dare you do that? How dare you treat me like that? You were so wrong as a mother. You didn't deserve to have me and stuff. And then what starts to happen is all of a sudden the person goes, oh, my God. I've made it all about me. This had nothing to do with me. What she did didn't define me. It hurt me. And I need to deal with that pain. But it defines her. But you see, the big problem, Joel, is when you're treated that way, you start treating yourself that way. So that mother that you had that was a bad mother, you now become a bad mother to yourself. And you start doing the things that she did to you. And that's why it's still an issue. Not because of what she did, but because what you're doing to yourself today with what she did. When you clean that up, then what she did becomes irrelevant. So you got to look at the mother that you're carrying around inside of you that still is kicking the shit out of you and telling you what a piece of shit you are, Joel. I found the best part in the book was the part that says perhaps she they are spiritually sick, just as I am. There's no perhaps. Uh, well, this one, forget the perhaps part, throw that out. She was. But see, as a kid, we're going to take it personally. I need you to love me. I want you to love me. If you don't love me, there must be something wrong with me, not you. You can't think of that as a kid. So you take that in. See, we call that an introjection. You introject that idea of yourself, and now that idea of yourself informs you. And now you start to treat yourself in the way that she treated you. That's where the problem is today. Not what she did then, what you're doing to yourself today. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, we're at the point where you could call on people if you'd like in the Hollywood. Oh, you guys just raise your hand. I just jump in or raise your hands, whatever you do. I don't. I, I also suggested that maybe Jay could interview you. So, you know, they could do that, or question. what you could do, Joel, is if if there you know someone that you want to invite in, we could tag team it. Oh, I do. I do. I hope he's still on. His name is Kevin Heaney. 
He's also a therapist and, and in the 12-step program. Uh, Kevin, are you still in there? Are you available? Maybe he disappeared. I saw him in the very last Hollywood Square. Kevin, I see you. I see you, that blue queer. Oh, well, he doesn't want it. Just, uh, just. Jay, Jay, what would you like to do? Yeah, ask Jay. Well, I'd just like to ask you a question, Alan, and, and thank you again for everything you do for all of us and and uh, all, all the great stuff. And um, so we uh, we spend a lot of time using a 1950s consciousness to define ourselves 75 years later. Yeah. Um, and uh, what is it that, you know, you mentioned our friend DMR, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz. Yeah. Um, who's, a, who's, you know, a, another seminal uh, author. Who else have you... Uh, used to find encouragement and uh, and inspiration in the past five, 10 years, people that are doing, you know, contemporary work and, and what what uh, what stuff in the uh, in your uh, field of work has uh, has fired your imagination? Well, you know, as I started to get into this area, right, being a being in recovery and then being trained as a psychologist and, and having some, I think, outstanding mentors and supervisors through the years um everything i learned in psychology i was relating, relating back to my recovery experience and trying to understand that more and and kind of give it more texture is the way i think about it jay is looking at the texture so i think you'll see if you read my books i i do i think a real decent job of integrating a lot of modern psychotherapists and their ideas into this whole discussion of emotional sobriety. And, and what becomes really obvious to me in the work and the research I've done is that Bill was capturing the zeitgeist of the times. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were people like Karen Horney, who you and I have talked about, a brilliant, what we would call neo-Freudian, who looked at things very different than Freud, but she talked about this emotional dependency. And she talked about where do you put your emotional center of gravity? She says, if you put your emotional center of gravity in anything other than yourself, you're in trouble. Well, when we're emotionally dependent, where do we put our emotional center of gravity? I put it in you, Jay. I put it in, in my job. I put it in the car I drive. I put it in, et cetera. How much money is in my bank account? I don't put it in me. And so when my emotional center of gravity is outside of me, guess what happens? You can pull the strings. I'm no longer running my life. I'm a puppet on the strings that I've attached to you. You didn't even attach him. I've attached him to you and I've handed you the control. So she's one of the people that's informed me. Hey, look, I'm a professional psychologist, a clinical psychologist. It's not a read for a lay person. I think you'd get lost in all of the, the psychoanalytic terminology and stuff right. but she contributed her book neurosis and human growth brilliant right that's one fritz pearls i'm a trained gestalt therapist fritz was wonderful he defined maturity and this is relevant to the letter and i use this all the time he defined maturity as the transcendence of environmental support to self-support well, what do we mean by environmental support? It's emotional dependency. He's talking about if I look and, and I now need your praise and pats on the back, then I become your slave. I turn everybody into a judge that can judge me and tell me how I'm going to feel about myself. So Fritz's idea about growing up and supporting yourself fits right along with what Bill says. Bill said it in the letter. At one point he goes, I realized that I had to, how did he say it? Cut off these faulty emotional dependencies on people, even upon AA. And people go, wait a minute, what's he doing? That seems to be like sacrilegious, what he just said. And why it's not is because the program grows you 
to take care of yourself. It doesn't mean you don't need anybody. It means that you take responsibility for what you need. You don't sit there. So that's another idea that I got from Fritz, Dr. Nathaniel Brandon's idea of self-esteem. It's brilliant. He talks about our biggest problem with self-esteem is we want is that that, you know, what does he say? That when you take responsibility for yourself, you realize that no one is here to live up to your expectations. Fritz said that as well. The Gestalt therapy prayer. Let me repeat that. It's wonderful. You are you. I am I. I do my thing. You do your thing. I am not here to live up to your expectations and you're not here to live up to mine. If by chance we meet, fine, let's enjoy it. If not, it can't be helped. That's emotional sobriety. That's what emotional sobriety is. That's the unhooking that Bill is talking about. So Virginia Satir, she says the same thing. She says, you know, life is what it is. It's how you cope with it that counts. Another one of her quotes that I use is that we must not let other people's limited opinions of us define us. I mean, listen to that. That's differentiation. So let's talk about that. Murray Bowen, a brilliant psychiatrist from this same time period. Now we're talking about the zeitgeist, 1950s, 1960s, 1940s, 40s to 60s and 70s, right in there, right? That spirit of times. Murray Bowen. One of the pioneers in family therapy comes up with this idea of differentiation. What is differentiation? Differentiation, when you have an undifferentiated consciousness, you take everything personally. You fuse yourself. Things have to be the way that you want them to be to be okay. As you grow and become differentiated, your consciousness changes. And now you can respect differences. You let go of the rules. He says, when you become a differentiated person, you can act on your own behalf without impinging on the rights of others. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I can act on my own behalf without impinging on anybody else's rights. But you see how everybody's talking about the same thing that Bill is. Mm -hmm. Well, you know how, how this works in history, you know, Jay. There, there's people that become the spokesperson for the emerging consciousness that's taking place. Now, unfortunately, psychology wanted to become a science. So we stopped exploring what I would call these more humanistic psychologies. And we started to go towards evidence-based practice like CBT. Now you'll see, even see in some CBT, mm -hmm. there's evidence, these, these, these erroneous beliefs we have, right? that Albert Ellis talked about and stuff like that. Well, that all relates back to this stuff. So there's so many things that inform me. Don Miguel Ruiz's work, The Four mm -hmm. Agreements. He calls about this is a program for, for freedom, for personal freedom, he calls it. The, this is a path to personal freedom. So Young, we can talk about Young's work on individuation. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this stuff is related to what Bill was talking about. And that's why I'm so excited about it. Because I think this, this is the key to life, in my opinion, is learning how to grow ourselves up. What I tell people is that when you run into trouble, and this is going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life, stay connected to the trouble. Don't run away from it. Don't try to resolve it too fast. Stay connected to the trouble, but add more of yourself to it bring more of yourself to that trouble because that's when you're going to grow up the way one more thing i'll say i get so excited about this fritz pearl says this way he says if you let the condition you're in control you then you learn how to start dealing with life instead of trying to control the condition you're in see great stuff man they were that you know what i would love someday we have an imaginary banquet where you and i sit down with all of these guys <laughs> and we have a dinner party <laughs> have you uh taken a look at uh christopher germer and Kristen neff's work the mindful no. self-compassion no send me send me the recommendation i, I will i will they're, they're good it friends fits, and great does it fit right within with all the stuff that 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 uh, that that we're talking about because it's exciting yeah. stuff, man. And it look at it's beautiful. 
Great question. Okay. Does anybody else want to deal in or do you want me to throw Alan another softball? I have a question, Jay. Uh, so do I, I've had my hand up for a while here. May I go? Please. Well, I want to thank you, Alan Berger. I've just discovered your videos a long, uh, not that long ago, and I've been watching them. And I'm also a therapist, or a next therapist because I'm retired now. But um, so, and I know some of these works you've referred to. I mean, the, and I really like the fact. I, I do think that you know people are surprised that people of 20 years go out. I'm not surprised because we need to do the work. And as you say, I call it conditioned beliefs. You call it dependencies. I don't really care what we call it. It's the same thing. It's, it's just a bunch of semantics. And I don't think we should, I don't want to get caught up in words. I think you have a very wonderful message. And I think your meeting with uh, Kagan and with the other guy, Larkin, are wonderful. And I think that's what recovery is all about. If I don't live the 12 steps every day, I'm going to go out. Why? Not because I jones about the drink or drug, but because I'm not happy, joyous, and free. And so it's just a question of time that I will go out if I don't attend to my emotional sobriety. And that's what I always talk about because I'm not, and it is about alcohol in a way because people get all bent out of shape if it's not about alcohol, but it is about alcohol, it's just indirect. It's not a direct link, it's an indirect link. And I also wanted to add that to me that one of the tasks in recovery is to shift 180 degrees away from looking outside myself to looking within. And that's a big task. I mean, you know, the also the third step prayer tells us that we should let go of the bondage of self. And I believe that. However, you better find out who you are before you let go of it. Is my I mean that's how I see it because if you don't know who you are and I'm not talking about the ego self but the true self, what are you letting go of? You don't even know, and so I believe that it's very important to figure out who we are, and and what we are, you know, so that we can let go of it. And I have agree with your idea of forgiveness that it's not about them; it's about us. And the four agreements say don't take anything personally. I think it should be in the big book personally, but what do I know? <laughs> oh, that, I think, that's right. And so don't don't take anything personally is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think it's it's something that you, you I have to learn as an alcoholic. And and certainly that allows me to get more freedom. And this program is about freedom. So I'm I'm with you all the way. Thank you. No, I sorry, I, uh, sorry I, Don, listen, I interrupted. I think one of, one of the reasons that I think that this did not become the spearhead of the next major development in the program, and this was unintentional, but I do believe the turn we made was to take a spiritual bypass to this inner work. Is that a lot of people said maybe if I can just turn this over. I don't have to get down and cry about it and scream about it and do the very, very painful work. I have been in therapy, so I've got 51 years. I probably at least clogged, clocked in at least 20 years of therapy in that 31 years. And I'll tell you, dealing with the grief and the loss of, of my dad was huge. I mean, huge. I didn't want to feel that pain. I didn't want to suffer any of that. I didn't want to go through the hell gates of suffering and all of that, all of that contributed to the whatever degree of, of emotional freedom that I experienced today. I do think that one of the things that happens as we do this work, where I, I think I'm a little different, we do go in, but when I go in, I realize that there's two things that are important to me. It's honoring myself, but also learning how to be connected to you. And see, that's the balancing between the I and the we. And that's the balance I think Bill was talking about, is that while I need to have, and of course, a healthier relationship with myself is going to allow me to have a healthier relationship with you. But the other is very true as well. If you want to see what a good program you have, get in a relationship. Because the more important somebody is to you, 
the more this shit is going to come up and you are going to have plenty of opportunities. I say there's nothing like a relationship to grow people. They are people growers like nothing else, just like AA is. Where This is a people growing program. Our relationships are people growers, man. They will help you see who you are and who you're not like nothing else in this world. And that's why I say trouble does not mean something's wrong. Trouble is your invitation to get to work on figuring out what the hell is going on with you. It's like putting a spotlight on your life. So... Thank you for sharing that, Joe. And there was one more, and then I do have to run yeah. to start that other meeting here in a couple meetings. Yeah. Don, right, Don, go for it. I'm Don. I'm alcoholic. Thank you, um, Dr. Berger. I, I was, I, I appreciate everything you said, and I've got a tremendous amount out of your talk on YouTube. So I thank you for that. Um, the thing that I was thinking about when you and Jay were talking was where um, Dr. So Silkworth talks about moral psychology, yes. and and when you go into the the writing of the big book book, it talks about that meaning turning outward to others in some, that's a you know quick way of saying it, yep. getting the alcoholic to focus on something other than themselves. And Bill in here says that his stability comes out of trying to give, not out of demanding to receive. So can you talk about the, the further talk into giving as a healer? Well, you know, and, and it's, it's also, I forgot to mention another person that's who informed me tremendously on the work I do is Dr. Victor Frankl. Yes. And he identifies self-transcendence as one of the most important things in self-actualization, is getting out of yourself and giving yourself to a cause that's greater than you. He says that is a necessary experience to now expand your consciousness. Because remember what we're talking about here is a very different kind of a consciousness than the one we started with that was so undifferentiated, so immature, so demanding that as our consciousness evolves, right? Now we see that we're just a small part of a much bigger thing here. And our job is to see what we can do to make a little difference in it all. And when we commit ourselves to that, we are actualizing that part of ourselves that really wants to give and wants to be of value, that wants to make a difference. And that's why recovery is about, what I say is, is recovery is about being able to find the appropriate balance and coordination of all of what you are. I'll say that again. Recovery is about finding the appropriate balance and coordination of all of what you are. And this is an important part of what we are, is to be able to make a difference and be of value to others. But look, my sponsor, Tom, said, Alan, you got to have something to give away. <laughs> <laughs> I see. He said he would not let me talk to one of the new guys that we were going out to help when we were doing 12-step calls. He says, your job is to clean up the puke. I'll do the talking. He says, later on, you can do the talking, but you don't have it. What you can give now is some physical labor. Shut your mouth. That's going to be your best contribution. All right, you guys. Well, thanks for inviting me tonight. I'll see you. And it was wonderful to spend some time with you tonight. Okay, we'll go straight to everybody turn off. Um, and I mean, uh, turn on the, turn off the mute and give your love to Dr. Berger. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Berger.